to the Serene Disciple Project. I'm headed back to the uh, farm. I thought this would be a good time to talk. Um, think of the truck as an extension of the porch. So this has been uh, a difficult week, a difficult couple of weeks for me. And, um, and I was not going to say anything, but then Kay encouraged me to let you in on what, uh, what's been going on. And so here we are. It's been a difficult week because it has been very difficult for me and, and many others to look at the pictures of George Floyd, that video, on the, uh, on the ground beside the police car, uh, Minneapolis police officer's knee on his neck. Um, I feel my gut clench. I feel a sense of fear and dread. And all of that because of something that happened to me last fall, not yet a year ago. So I thought I'd share that story with you. So I was driving home much like I am now, and uh, I had come through one of the small towns uh, between Austin and the farm, and, uh, and looked in the rearview mirror, and there was the lights of a police car. No, not, not the lights of a police car, the lights of a lot of police cars. It was a, a tsunami of police cars coming behind me. Well, that was a problem, but... You know, I couldn't remember speeding or, or uh, somebody was in trouble. That was for sure. So I, I went ahead and pulled over. Hang on. Let me pull over. So I pulled over. But they didn't go around me as I expected. What they did instead was fan out behind me. And they started jumping out of their patrol cars and doors open hiding behind the doors and they pointed their pistols and they pulled out assault rifles and they pointed those out as they pointed those at me as well now, I don't know if you've been on the business end of an assault rifle in that circumstance but it'll get your attention and I still had no idea what was going on and so there I sat looking at a bunch of guys hiding behind their doors, safeties off, fingers on the trigger, all pointing at me, just waiting for me to make a mistake. And then I heard an amplified voice of the officer say, open your window. So I, I opened my window and then the voice said, put your hands out of the window. So I, I put my hands out of the window and then the voice said, with your right hand, open the door, and then step out, and don't turn around. Well, now we had a problem, because I was wearing a seatbelt. Apparently, people that they normally deal with in this circumstance don't wear seatbelts, so it's not part of the training. I don't know. But, but I have a seatbelt on, so I couldn't do that. So I yelled out of the window, I have to undo my seatbelt! And the officer yelled back, with your right hand, open the door, and then step out, and don't turn around. And I yelled back, I have to undo my seatbelt. And it was escalating. And he said, with your right hand, open the door, and step out, and don't do anything else, and do that right now. Well, there, we were at an impasse. Because if I reached down into my right, if I took my hand out of the window and reached down to undo my seatbelt, I was afraid they would think that I was pulling a gun. I thought they'd shoot me. On the other hand, if I didn't comply with what they were saying, this thing was going south fast. I thought they might shoot me anyway. And I had a, I had a dark thought pass through my head in that moment. I thought... You know, if they have to unbuckle my dead body to get me out of this truck, Kay is set for life. Huh. I didn't know what to do. Was terrified, heart pounding, and so totally confused because I had no idea why this was happening. And so I tried one more time. I have to undo my seatbelt. And there was a pause. 
And the voice, a little confused, said, Oh, right. Do that. And then step out. And don't turn around. And Okay. We're making progress. So I stepped out. And things happened kind of fast after that. I was incapacitated, to put it mildly. Arms jerked behind my back with, I thought, a little too much force. Handcuffed. My old arthritic shoulders screaming and I ended up face down on the hood of a patrol car while they searched me. And then I was put in the back of the one of the patrol cars and shoulders hurting and, and wrists burning and all the way back into Austin to the county jail and then through the first part of the booking process. All in all, I was in handcuffs about three hours. And uh, then... I was brought before a magistrate in shackles and then I spent the night as a guest of the county in a small lockdown cell with a roach about the size of my thumb and I knew where he was most of the time and then turned out onto the street at 5 a.m. shoulders on fire wrists and hands numb, exhausted because neither I nor the big roach got any sleep that night. So what had happened? Why was I forced to go through all of that? Well, here's the problem. I had purchased a new revolver in Austin and I was pretty excited about it. And at the stoplight in that little town, I had picked up the gun and, and looked at it and put it back down. And that was all. It seems that someone in another car saw me and became, and I quote, frightened and offended at the sight of the gun. Someone was scared and offended. Now, I have a license to carry a handgun. And in Texas, your vehicle is considered an extension of your home. So I didn't even need a license to have the gun in my truck. I had done nothing wrong. Uh, nothing even remotely illegal, which did not prevent me from staring down the wrong end of pistols and assault rifles, being dragged out of my truck, cuffed, taken to jail. Me, an overeducated, old, pudgy white guy. Imagine if I'd been black. Would it have turned out differently if I had been black? I don't know. Now, I'm a member of Texas uh, Law Shield, a legal services company for gun owners, and I called them from jail. They hired and paid for a good lawyer. And when my charges and my good lawyer showed up at the courthouse, months later, the charges were dropped. I really hadn't done anything wrong. The legal fees were covered, but it cost me hundreds of dollars to get my truck back. My shoulders still give me problems from time to time and require steroid shots to keep pain at bay. And unless I pay more money to have it expunged, the record of my arrest will appear on every background check for the rest of my life. But beyond all of that, now, when I see George Floyd on the ground with the knee on his neck begging for his life, I think, I think that could have been me could have been one of my kids or my wife could have been you and when I hear black people friends loved ones or people I don't know talk about their fear their dread when they see a police car coming even though they've done nothing wrong knowing that that might not matter at all I know just a little bit of what that feels like I still, 10 months later, feel that clenching in my gut when I pass a police car, that quickening of my heart when I see the police car behind me. I see in my mind that little circle of darkness at the end of an assault rifle barrel. I feel a twinge of pain in my shoulders, and if I'm honest, I feel a slow swelling of anger. Not only could that have been me on the ground begging for my life, it still could be. Now, I'm not inclined to toss a brick through a shop window and leave with a TV set, but having had my very small taste of systemic mistreatment, you know, I can't be too critical of people who have lived with that sense of frustration baseline dread and simmering anger for their whole lives, for generations. 
who are ready to proclaim that they are mad as hell and won't take it anymore. I get it, just a little bit. Black lives matter. And of course, of course, all lives matter. But not all lives have been the focus of systemic multi-generational racism. Now you may or may not agree with that, okay, whatever. But next time you're driving home and you see that patrol car pull in behind you and put its lights on, and you feel that dread, that tightening in the pit of your stomach, you could find in short order a knee on your neck, or the neck of someone you love. You could find yourself pinned to the hood of a police car with no idea why. If it could happen to me, it could happen to you. And so I wonder, do you have the capacity to feel empathy without the terror of thinking that you're about to be shot without knowing why? You know, to be honest, I'm not sure I did, but I do now. Well, I should get on home. Wish me luck. <laughs> now that's something to think about. Well, I'll see you next week.